Women Matters in September 2022. And after having talked a lot about family individuation and whatnot, about setting boundaries and so on, today we want to talk about how is it to be in somebody else's space? What comes up for you? But before, as always, we do a check-in. And I would start with Vienna today. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Monia, and I still live in Vienna. And uh, we had some uh, photographs of Google of our street. And my husband was work, uh, walking there. It, it was taken about six months ago. So uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. But I haven't seen any photographs of uh, being of our balcony when we, I sit there and read. But we'll, yeah, so it's really amazing. They, they, how they do this, I don't know, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have rain and sunshine and rain and sunshine again. So it's, it's autumn, it's a, it's a little, yeah, it's, it's more like autumn here already. And I don't mind, I feel better when the air is not that hot and humid. I guess everybody does. And yeah, that's about, I have been trying to uh, remember what Wilbur wrote in uh, excerpt G. I don't know if you are still familiar. I, I translated it about 19 years ago and they are now discussing it in, in the integral salon in Vienna. And I don't remember anything at all. <laughs> so, and uh, I threw it out already because I thought I probably never Need it again, and now I'm trying to, uh, but it's on, online already, and so it's no problem, but it's amazing because everybody said, oh, you are the expert, and I said, you translated it, I don't remember it at all. So anyway, uh, Hani Lee, you are, I would like to pass on to you. Thank you, Monia. I'm Hani Lee, I'm Janice Bixtel, and um, yeah, here yeah, it's interesting, it's sp definitely spring, it's Amazing to go for a walk in the morning. All the fragrances just getting from all the flowers and the spring blossoms. It's just beautiful, the colors. And, and um, so it's really incredible to go on an early morning walk to just wake up with that into the day. And um, it's already during the day very hot, really like summer and dry. And we hope for some rain soon too. And um, I'm personally delighted that. The universe has an interesting sense of humor. And sometimes we want to, we have, we have an idea of how to bring something into being and then the universe surprises us with completely a different way where I've been invited to share some of our sense-making processes functionality into a business application. And that will be amazing. So it's coming in at the back door into become corporates to share amazing work. Um, and bringing people back to the human in terms of the business world and the workplace. So I'm delighted about that opportunity, how it just made a U-turn of what I anticipated. So I don't have to do all the hard work to get into organizations and people will be able to use it during their normal business functions, which I'm delighted about. And I'm complete and I'll pass on to Christine. Uh, good morning, Christine in Carlsbad, California. Um, we just went through a very hot spell, um, really hot. Uh, fortunately, there were no fires and it kind of ended over the weekend and we actually had some rain from a tropical storm that came up through Mexico. So that's really unusual when we get rain in the summertime, but that was nice. Um, the heat caused some problems for people. It was really excessive. Uh, and I guess the past two weeks, I'm, I'm have been re-traumatized by American politics because Trump is the problem that never seems to go away. He just is a dangerous person. <laughs> and uh, so things have been re-dominated by the 
documents that they found. And I think the media, I think it's partly the media that tries to keep us on edge and, you know, everything's a catastrophe. But nonetheless, it's, um, I try to, you know, be judicious about how much time I spend with the news and particularly with politics, because it's never happy. <laughs> but I think Trump has, I, I mean, he's just, he's never ending. And I don't understand, I don't understand what's going on. I really, I don't understand what's going on. Never in my lifetime has anything been like this. And uh, it's very confusing and sad. So this week I will like continue to venture uh, to keep my distance uh, from politics and, and see how that goes. And I will hand off to Victoria. Hello, um, Victoria in not too far away from Christine, <laughs> although we still haven't met in person. Um, and yeah, it's really actually really lovely this morning because it it's um, it rained. Well, I don't know if it rained in the night, but it's um, did it rain up there too? <laughs> it's very cool right now and really lovely air. Um, I just came back from morning mass because I go every morning. Um, and today, an, an hour ago, 15 years ago, um, my husband Conrad died. And um, so today's a big anniversary and Beatrice and I um, always celebrate it together, but uh, she's in New York today and I'm here in California. And she um, she would have been on this call, but she, uh, she won an audition, which is great. Um, she's in a, she's going to be in a, a production, a theater production that opens, I think two weeks from now. And today is the first rehearsal. So she's in rehearsal right now, even as we speak. So um, I hope that goes well. It's her first, it's the first rehearsal this morning. So we'll see what that was like. Um, so later on, we're going to do something to commemorate um, her father and my late husband. And it's strange because it still feels like it was yesterday or actually today. I woke up this morning and it felt I felt the same as I did that morning. Um, so, yeah, so that's sort of where I am. I wasn't actually to, going to come to Women's Matters this morning because I was feeling sort of so, you know, melancholy. And then I thought, um, actually, <laughs> because of you, Monia, I thought. I thought you were my my connection to Vienna right now, and I thought I thought you. It's appropriate that um, there be some dialogue where um, between the continents um, on this day of all days, and um, yeah. So so it's a it, one of the what Conrad I like to talk about was what he called the jokes of the angels, which are um, seeming. Um, I mean, what Hanali said that the universe has a sense of humor and. Um, and Conrad's term was always the jokes of the angels because they're not, they're just little synchronicities that let us know that everything is the way it should be in the universe, even if we don't perceive it. So just little tiny, sometimes humorous or sometimes just little light, um, you know, gentle things. But um, yesterday I got an email from a, um, a Latin um, men's chorus, um, the uh, uh, liturgical, they sing in the churches. And tonight at 9 p.m., they are singing um, the Latin um, Vespers for the Dead um, because one of their choral members just passed away, apparently. So they're doing it in his honor, but they invited the public. And I just got the email last night and I thought, well, that's totally extraordinary. So I'm planning to go tonight. It's late. It's at nine o'clock at night, which is kind of strange, but I just thought that's that's one of those, you know, jokes of the angels. So um, anyway, so that's sort of the way my, the beginning of the day and the end of the day um, today. And um, so I will pass to you, Heidi, our gracious yeah. hostess. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, here yeah, it had rained a little bit last week and my spring has a tiny little bit of water, tiny little bit, but you know, <laughs> anyway, I'm grateful for that, that it comes back the water and in winter it will be more, but I have to 
to do some provisions for next year. As long as I'm living here alone, I can manage with the tanks, water tanks I have. But as soon as there would be more people, it would be a problem. Then you are talking about politics, um, Christine. I think we better don't talk about it because it's such a mess everywhere, everywhere. Also in America, both parts for me is on a total, total mess. I would all blame all on Trump. But I also think that um, the speech your president gave was not very kind to denigrate half of the population as fa uh, fascists, let's say that I don't think a president should do. So I think it's a sign of the all madness which is in the world. And um, yeah, especially in Germany, in Austria, I think too. But in Germany, it's really crazy. Um, we will see how we can get over the winter. I, I mean, I don't have a problem. I don't need gas from Russia. I have wood to heat my... <laughs> my my room so i'm not directly concerned but many people are and there's a big fear of what will happen and you know economy is crashing in germany and what what not so we better don't talk about it but talk about uh, what is concerning us in our topic series of topics what is when people are staying or when you are staying in how in the house of other people how is um, it for you yeah i would like just before we start i would like to know uh did uh, the media report about the death of queen elizabeth in the united states and in south africa because our media all all day long and i don't Seth understand why because after the brexit we shouldn't really be that interested in great britain anymore but the report on the death of Queen Elizabeth in every detail. And all it, now we just had a mass from Edinburgh, a memorial mass. And so you don't, in, in South Africa, they don't. Of course they, they do, they do. They do. Oh. Yeah, but uh, with a very different slant, complete from a colonialism point of view. Uh -huh. it's not, so it's not, positive. it's not the same as in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It's it's a completely different angle of she shouldn't be celebrated because she kept colonialism alive. So it's and the whole of Africa, for that matter, is sta is standing up against it. Um, mm -hmm. That it that she's glorified, mm -hmm. but also yeah. <laughs> I agree. With, I agree with Heidi. It's also something that I wouldn't even that I don't even want to discuss. But yeah, it's 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 all over, and uh, lots of backlash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in in the United States, did you hear about it? A, lot, a lot of coverage. They have. I mean, it's been ongoing since she oh. died. Oh. Um, oh. They have. I've seen several specials already. You know, the documentary of her life, and mm -hmm. um, okay. yeah, they're covering already the funeral procession and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of coverage and a lot of interest. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. it's amazing because. All of a sudden, 9-11 wasn't in the media yesterday. It was just the death of the queen. So she sort of, uh, yeah, that was, although they will never forget what I just saw. So, yeah. I uh, wanted to say, Hanneli, there are some media outlets, not the mainstream outlets in Germany, who are talking about the other side, about the colonial and the, the uh, the things which have happened under the surface. So it's not only there. Some of the more, let's say, conscious uh, journalists are writing about that too. So. OK, thank you. That was just okay. nice. Something else about uh, world uh, problems, world events, before we go into our personal events? No, OK. How is it to be in the space of others? Who wants to start? Who has this experience often? I will start. Well, I have been a professional nomad for the last, since 2013. And it, so I have stayed with people for short periods of time, also for longer periods of times, but 
not as a, sometimes as a guest, but also paying. So it's both sides. And I'm grateful for that experience because I personally am a gypsy. I, I don't like to be held by at one place anymore. So I, I, I love to travel. Even before that time, I love to travel. And but what I learned from myself is that my sense of self became clearer and clearer. So where, where do I begin and where others begin? And what do I take on from others? So uh, it's not necessarily a boundary, but it's how I absorb other people's energy. But if you're in somebody else's space, for myself, it's I'm aware of them because I'm sensitive, so I'll easily pick up. <clears throat> they need their space now and I need mine. Um, so that's always very visible. And then I'll remove myself if I feel that they need space. And so it's, it, make, it made me a lot more intuitive and sensitive to other people's needs and, and their space, because I'm the guest, so to speak. And for myself, I became stronger in myself. My, my own sense of self became much stronger. And my own needs of when do I need to remove myself for my own sake? and to go for a walk or go out for the day in the likes. But it's also taught me a lot about other humans on how incredibly diverse we are. And that there is no right and wrong in that sense, so to speak. Everybody's perspectives and their ideas and their opinions and their ways are unique and relevant for them and valid. So on that sense, also, it's assisted me to respect other people on a level that I didn't do necessarily when I was living in my own house. And because I stayed with so many different types of people in different cultures, in different places, um, I learned a lot about other cultures, incredibly a uh, lot of wisdom and knowledge about other cultures, which I didn't knew before because it wasn't relevant to me. And that deeper understanding helped me to also how I connect with other people and how I perceive them from my point of view really changed. It really transformed. So it made me a richer person. And it also made a lot of tolerance and understanding on levels that I didn't need before. So I think it's when you're in other people's space, it's two sides. And to know um, the biggest one, I think, is to know to remove yourself and when not to, and when to to be sensitive to other people's um, needs, but also not to self-sacrifice. You are, who you are, your own energy. And if you feel that you're drained, you, you remove yourself and or you go and do something else. So that's in short, I'll start with that. I'm wondering if one of the basic questions in this regard is that we don't like to be taken advantage of. So, uh, as you said, uh, Anneli, you have to be sensitive towards the expectations of others as well. That's what, what just came into my mind. Um, yeah, and it's particularly difficult with children. When your own children grow up and are they still taking advantage of you or is it just uh, your impression or can you never be, as a mother, can you never refuse? So these are, I guess it, this was also Christine's topic to some respect. So I pass on to Christine. You are mute. I'm thinking uh, in terms of being in somebody else's space, I haven't, other than being on a vacation, I haven't really been in somebody else's space for any prolonged period of time. So I feel like mostly when I'm uh, sharing space with another person in their home, I'm, you know, I'm the guest. So I'm very conscious of 
being polite and, and doing all the considerations um, of that. Uh, Tom and I usually have arguments when we visit and stay with other people, almost always. <laughs> so now that, now that that's become a pattern, uh, trying to uh, prevent that, but he feels much freer to do his own thing. And I'm always the one who's like, no, we want to go along with everybody else. And, and you know, I, I don't want to rock the boat. Um, and he's, he's fine with rocking the boat and doing his own thing and not, not being too concerned about the impact. So then he and I have that power struggle between ourselves. Um, and he often gets aggravated with me because he feels like I've abandoned him um, in favor of whoever it is we're staying with or whatever family or who, whomever the host is. I'm more considerate of them. And he feels that I end up abandoning him, which you know is true to some extent. <laughs> He's not wrong uh, about that. So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing to stay true to ourselves, but also be considerate uh, guests. I have a hard time with that anyway. Um, and I'm thinking that the other time that's kind of unique, uh, we used to do a lot of home exchange um, with people. And usually for two or three weeks at a time, we would go and stay at their home and they would stay at ours, share cars and, and all of that. Um, and it was a lot, it, it was a wonderful experience because we got to see what it was really like to live in other people's communities and live in somebody else's house. Um, so that was always pretty extraordinary. Always learn things by doing that. Uh, learn things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to learn by living, a, you know, by staying in a hotel. Um, it's, it's really something to kind of put yourself in somebody else's life in, in their own home. So, um, that was always enjoyable, always a lot of work because before we would leave, we'd have to get our house ready. And that often took weeks of preparation just to kind of make it clean enough and every make sure everything's working and everything's in place. Um, but people often would ask us, aren't you afraid to have people in your home? And a lot of people have that reaction. They either don't want somebody sleeping in their bed it, which is often a, a reaction. I don't want anybody else sleeping in my bed. Um, and then I guess people become concerned that we'll be robbed or they'll take advantage of us in some way. Um, but that never, that never happened. And I never felt we had anything really in particular that people were gonna necessarily wanna run off with. Um, plus we were staying at their home and we knew where they lived. So it wasn't like they were gonna be able to uh, Get, get very far with that. Um, but a lot of people have that reaction that they could not, uh, they, some people love the idea and then the other section of people are like, I could never have somebody stay in my house if I wasn't there. So um, that sense of propriet, proprietary, uh, um, proprietariness over your own domicile. Um, I guess that's about it. Not, not a whole lot of reactions to spending uh, time and energy in somebody else's split space because it's usually a positive experience with the exception of, as I said, you know, the conflict that Tom and I get into uh, uh, regarding how considerate or, or how much we need to go with the flow. So um, I will pass off to Victoria. I'm not sure if she heard us, Victoria. Christine. Oh, sorry, I, I zoned out for a minute. Sorry, what was it? Christine passed over to you about your oh. experiences with being in somebody else's house. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm having kind of a hard time today. Um, um, well, I, I think... Yeah, I think for me it's always it's always been 
a learning experience and something very, very positive for the most part. Um, although sometimes it's been really hard because um, I've I'm very, in general, very hypersensitive about other people's boundaries. So I have some really, I mean, people that I, in a spiritual sense, think are very close friends that I've um, that live in other cities. I've stayed with them, and um, it's been a totally nerve wracking experience just because I'm. I don't know, I'm just hypersensitive about, you know, if I'm, because they're very, um, um, what's the word? Um, they're very, you know, they don't, they don't like to use water, uh, too much water. And so they have all these rules and regulations about how you have to take a shower outside if you want to take a shower, because it takes too long for the inside shower to the heat, the hot water to warm up and I mean, all kinds of rules and regulations. And so so it's kind of, a, it's interesting because it's, I think sometimes being in another person's space, you learn other aspects of them that are hard to deal with. And um, and I'm notoriously paranoid and insecure when I'm in other people's space. Well, in general with other people. Um, so that's that's always a struggle to sort of feel like I'm not doing the wrong thing at the wrong time or or, you know, using too much water or or not setting the table right if I'm trying to help out or or maybe I shouldn't offer to help out if it's their territorial space. I, I, it's it's awkward sometimes. But in terms of traveling around the world and staying with people, that's been really amazing. and that's that's the best way to learn about the world, I think. Um, I think I agree with what Hanali said about um, that's that's the the best way to learn about another culture and even um a long time ago i don't know if it's still possible but i traveled um in europe in the i don't know when it was maybe the early 80s and in some cities like budapest um there was a big disp the, like the, the actual hotels were astronomically expensive and i i didn't have any money i was a student um but you could stay in a private room in a house or an apartment, of course, Budapest, um, for a very, you know, small amount of money. And it was like a kind of bed and breakfast thing. And that for me was really special, like to, I mean, I, how else would one have an opportunity like that unless you had Hungarian friends, you know, and, and I still remember that was like one of my favorite things, staying with this old couple in this tiny ancient apartment in, um, in Budapest and just everything, the furniture and and then, you know, and they served us breakfast and it just felt so authentic. And you know, it was like for, I just felt privileged, even though, I mean, I was paying them to stay there. It was, a, but but it felt, um, I don't know, it was just, so I, I've, and I did that in Asia too, um, where I stayed with that, with people instead of staying um, in a hotel or something. And, um, that's yeah, I think that's a real privilege. I think it's funny, like the Airbnb thing is so um is all the rage. And I tried to stay in one once when I was desperate in New York City, and it was the most horrible experience I've ever had in my whole life. The all the drains were clogged and the bathtub was overflowing and everything was filthy. <laughs> and I moved out at midnight because I didn't want to pay the man because I thought it was such a he was such a cheat. So I called him at midnight and I said, I am not sleeping here. Um, and I told him all the reasons. And I said, you know, to, as a matter of principle, I will now leave so that I don't actually stay here the night. Um, and yeah, so so I think it's ironic that people think that's the way to get to know another culture. Because to me, it's it seems almost mercenary, like renting out your apartment to strangers, but there's not that intimacy of being a guest that um, I, I like the old fashioned, the like what I did in Budapest much better of actually like being with the, with the people and learning, you know, getting acquainted. So um, I hope, am I on the right topic? I don't know, I'm, I'm a little zoned out today because of Conrad, so, um, okay. So I'm not sure who, to whom to pass. Um, Okay, to you, Heidi. I, yes, and I wanted to answer to you, so but you better don't come in summer to my place because you would have a lot of water 
restrictions because we just don't have water. <laughs> So we have to, to be very parsimonious. You know, for instance, I ask the people when they do showers to, to conserve the water and use it for the toilet and things like that. But it's not because, you know, for principle, but it's because it's a necessity, actually. Oh, no, I, I know that. I um, There's an <laughs> island here, um, Catalina, where they have a perpetual water shortage, and you have to do that. You have to use all the water has to be multi multi-purpose so i i'm familiar with that and i'm very i'm very environmentally conscious so that's not what i meant i meant i meant more the feeling judged by the people like like the, you're in their house and you're not sure if you know they see you as a criminal or not <laughs> yeah and then that's horrible yeah yeah so for me um it depends on the people in some people's houses i feel completely free in some people's houses, I think it's better I go tomorrow or I take myself off completely because, oops, that's not the right, uh, the right way of, of being. And then, you know, some behaviors which I don't find problematic at all, they excuse me of doing things and I think, oops, what is that? So, yes, you can learn a lot about it, but you also then after certain experiences, you wouldn't go to the same house again. You know, yeah. Altogether, I think I more than not, I also take myself away. I don't want to be a disturbance to other people. And so sometimes I would prefer to 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 be in a bed and breakfast. But as you said, bed and breakfast, really, it's like this. I had twice here in Italy people who were very nice, where we slept in bed and breakfast. So, you know, it depends also on the mentality of people. If they do it for commercial, when they have a big flat and rent out all the, the rooms, or if it is a, a, a family or somebody who has just a, a room they don't use and uh, they, they they are much more human, let's say, you know, and accept and you as a as a welcome guest and as you know i had i don't want to say thousands but very many guests here in my house and i like to be with people but i'm so much used that people come to me that i hardly have an experience to be in somebody else's house because always it's a bit difficult for me to leave the place so but altogether I try to collaborate. I, 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 I like to collaborate. I like when there is something to be done to, to help. And sometimes it's appreciated, sometimes not. And okay. But to sit down and get served, as some people do, that would feel awkward to me, really not. I couldn't do that. I, I, I really want also to, you know, when you work together in the kitchen or do something, it's it's a different connection also otherwise you are you know a paying guest in a hotel okay then that's a different a different situation yeah i know when people come to me i also have certain expectations on correctness and on you know not to <laughs> sometimes at some time I had a group of people then at three o'clock at the night they they made a lot of noise and so that's then I have to go out and say no you know you cannot do that because all the neighbors they are far away but at night the noise travels so I am a little bit in the situation of not wanting to do to give too many rules but some are needed. And normally I expect people to, for, uh, let's say, a civil behavior. And I would say in 80% of the cases, that's that's the case that people are respectful and uh, consider this, the, the place, you know. Helpful, 50%, I would say, or 40% helpful in the sense that they would uh, participate in what needs to be done e even less sometimes uh, depends what it is but my own experience i have to say mainly my family members in, um, in their houses and that's normally okay that's no problem 
So. Would you like to talk also when people are in your sp space, uh, not necessarily family members, but also guests, how that is for you? How you feel, do you feel challenged? I sometimes feel challenged, but depends, not, not always. Often I really enjoy it to, to be together with people and talk and eat together and cook together. I bring them to, to nearby places and so. And I like that. So how is it for you? I like it as well. When I at my house, I love to have people, visitors from other parts of the world coming. So if I heard somebody's coming to South Africa, so you can come stay with me for a few days and then I'll take you around. So I also like that. I also like to, because I love entertaining and I love to, to nourish and treat people, so it helps me, it brings my nurturing side out. So I love doing that. And it is why it's the same as when I'm in other people's space. I learn so much from them as well. And I'm very easygoing as that. It's very interesting for me is the type of people that I attracted when I did when I still had my house. Um in that in that context. It was always very easy people who who just, you know, they they really started into what we were doing. They didn't disrupt our flow, um, so that part. But I just want to add something, Heidi, before I pass on to somebody else about this, is what was interesting for me being in somebody else's space, especially when I was also uh, looking, I was sitting for people. I did that a lot for my own, for my sister and her daughter when they were traveling or um, even for some friends. Then you also, because you're responsible for their home, because they are away and they and, and they all had pets so you would also take care of the pets so it's hard work yes it's a lot of hard work to then like I think Christine you said it's the same you you or it's you Victoria you you it's a lot of responsibility and then you must there's a fine line between it become a duty or where you, whether you love doing it so you have to be very honest with yourself as well uh, because it's a nice experience because it's always very different and you learn also how those people live and their neighbors and their community. But on your on a personal level, you learn a lot. But what the interesting thing for me was is when I lived with other people, um, is that their value systems were something. And I think Victoria, you touched a little bit on it uh, as well. That their value systems um, is interesting. Whether I can contain myself and be who I am. It with, it with somebody who's got a scarcity mindset, for example. It's very interesting because it's not like we, in Cape Town, we also had no water three years ago. So we literally had to collect everything, all every drop of water that we could reuse for whatever reason. So that was uh, for that whole year, people in Cape Town had to do that. There was simply no water. But this is different is when when you not when you have an abundance mindset, for example, and somebody else has a, a lack mindset or a scarcity mindset, it's very, it's very difficult then to be in that environment because it's completely against your value systems or how you see the world. Or they might think the world's a very terrible place and it's unsafe and uh, or they or they racist or whatever. It, that's very that's an interesting part then to your sense of self to because if you are there for a specific time. It's very difficult then to, um, it's, it takes a lot of energy to, to maintain your own sense of self, and your own value system when you're around such people that you don't, that you don't, because otherwise you feel unbalanced and it, you might, it might even drain you because it's such heavy energy. So that's just another part to it as well of, of you really having to learn to um, maintain your own space, your own, and create your own sacred space as well in whatever way is possible whatever that means for you, that you have your time, your me time, and that you're not always in the face of other people. And considering the situation, how you can do that. So you become very creative as well in, in that sense. Um, but uh, if I now think back of some of the people who, who came to stay with me, we had so much fun. It was, it was, it was always for me uh, the light to take them around and to go and show them interesting places and do interesting things for them as well, to give them a taste of South African culture as well, uh, especially if they came from different parts like Turkey, if they came here for them. Some of them has never seen a wild animal. 
So going to show them the wild animals was just incredible. Um, and, and things like that, you know, things that they're not used to in their culture. It's very, that was really enriching. And, and I'm really, I really appreciate that I was able to do that all those years um, in that sense. And also from a business, we had many people, uh, business colleagues coming from other countries and they would come and visit. And again, it's the same. So then it's not on a professional level, it's on a personal level. Where you get to know them when you live with them for a while, even if it's for three days. It, it's, you, get, you see another side to them. And I think Victoria, you see it as well. You see other sides of people that you otherwise wouldn't see. Thank you, Uncle I've had the experience of wondering why people don't come and visit. <laughs> because uh, I've lived in California. I moved from the East Coast and I've lived here for 45 years and Tom almost the same. And we have had a lot of friends and family who have never come from the East Coast to visit in California. And it's a little, we think it's a little odd. And it, it may be because we often go, we used to go back a whole lot um, for vacations and holidays and spent a lot of time on the East Coast and we still do. But it always kind of struck us. It's almost like, people in certain sections of the country, or at least uh, in the more traditional Northeastern corridor, they don't venture out as much or um, the perception of California, I don't know, is maybe just a little too weird for them. I don't know. But uh, I've often wondered, you know, what is it? Is it that they don't want to make that kind of a trip or we're not enticing enough <laughs> for them to come and visit? But I've often wished people uh, would come and visit more uh, because we are pretty, uh, pretty far away from a lot of the people that, uh, that we know. So, yeah. The same is for me. For instance, one of my brothers, he was here last time, I think 30 years ago. And the other, maybe <clears throat> 25 years ago, only one of my brothers uh, comes uh, he has a, um, a camp uh, on the lake one hour, one and a half hours away. Normally I go there when they are here, but sometimes they come over. My sister from America, from California, she was here when her boy was about six, seven, the, the youngest, and now he's over 30, so it's a while ago too. <laughs> And I also think sometimes uh, maybe they don't like me enough that they want to come. I don't know. You know, they go, um, they don't come, my brother, my eldest brother, they don't come so low down in Italy. They, even their children, they, they, who have now already children again, uh, they are in the north of Italy, but they never came, came down to me. So... I'm wondering, so maybe I'm a horrible aunt or something, I don't know. I don't think, and Christina, I don't think it's you guys. I don't pick that up. I, 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 my own eldest brother, he owns a beautiful space at the coast and we've never had the opportunity to visit there because of, they didn't want, none of my siblings or my mother when she was alive was allowed to visit there. And we always found it strange. And we always spoke about it. Now that's very interesting because they are, at that time specifically, they were hardly ever there because they lived in the, you know, in the countryside, more inland, more to Germans, in the free state. And then I think it was a year or two ago, we discovered that the reason why they didn't want us to come and visit there was not because they didn't want us there, but the house, the, the storage the way the house, the storage system how the house was built in that area is still very, it's still very old. And it, it needs to be cleaned every day with, by a truck. You know, it's very, it's very primitive, actually, if you think about it, although it's a beautiful little town, you know, at, at the coast. And that so they felt embarrassed to have some of us come and visit for that reason. But we went for Almost 30 years, we were not aware of it. And it's still today, and for them to change it is very expensive. And I mean, my brother's 69. So 
from that perspective, suddenly I realized that we were really unfair because we made assumptions. So I, so I just want to tell you two ladies, it's sometimes assumptions that we make about other people, but in your case, it's the, the, the reverse way, but it's, 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 it's something that other people might feel ashamed of while they don't want to come to you. It's not about you, it's about them something about them it's not always about us so I just want to share that with you because that came up when you both were sharing that that it's not really always about us it's about the other people but Christine both you and I I mean I, I, I personally my own experience with people from the east coast when I was in the states is um, even when I was there they treated me very differently from the people when the people when I was on the west coast it is a big culture shock, actually, between the two, for me as a foreigner. So I think that, that might have something to do with it as well. It's just the little ways, you know, like little behaviors and ways of doing stuff. I mean, a, a lot of Tom's siblings have never visited us, but they live in the town that they grew up in. A lot of our friends really stayed put. Um, and there's not as much movement there as, as there is on the West Coast. So there, there's that. Yeah, and my friend, my friend in, in, um, in the Boston area, when I was there in, 20, in 2007 or 2008, um, he said to me that people there don't travel. They stay in their own state. He said there's some of the, of the people who live there that never been outside of their own state. So that could also be because that's on the east coast. So and I found it, I found it extraordinary, you know, because it was like, how can you not want to travel at least in your own country? I'm not talking about abroad. But he said people would never even leave their own town. They would they would they would get schooling there and they would they go to university and they stay there. They don't go and work elsewhere, so they don't ever get out of that environment. It could be something like this. I think you're onto something there. Well, in all our discussions and what you said, there is one sentence that sort of stuck to my mind. And of course, this is a very private space, but I was wondering if we could talk about our personal beliefs, because Victoria said that she's going to morning mass every morning. And that really sort of, um, yeah, amazed me. So I was wondering if we could talk about personal belief systems. And uh, yeah, is this close by Victoria? that you just uh, have to go across the street or, or do you have to drive there or? Um, it's an well, interrogation. <laughs> what? I said, this is an interrogation. I wanted before you answer, say to Monia, other people sit an hour on the, or two hours in meditation. And isn't that uh, more or less the same thing? Just, just asking, so. <laughs> Are you asking? Everybody. No, I was responding to Monia because I I have intuited a little bit that she finds it strange that somebody is going to mess mess every day, and so I thought so many people are doing meditation in the morning. Uh, so, uh, well, I guess there is a difference. Is there? Between, really? to me there is a difference between. Yeah, difference yeah. There's a huge difference. Um, yeah. Okay. Um. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> The well, the the as yeah, they all require driving. Um, uh, I mean, none, none of them are none of the local churches are that close. Well, there, there is one where I used to walk every day um, up and down the hill, um, but it's it's more complicated than that because I go I go to the mass. Uh, there's certain priests that I really like, so I mm -hmm. the the one that used to be the one that I walked to every day. He retired, so we follow him around he he <laughs> now that he's retired he goes to different churches mm -hmm. um it, yeah i think it for, for me um and as you know i've been i've been um involved with 
various kinds of contemplative meditation and things for years. Um, there, yeah, it's a totally different thing. Um, that it's 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 well well for me the biggest thing, and this is why even though I'm not officially Catholic, I'm Catholic with a small C. Um, that I really I really really strongly believe in the Eucharist and that's the um so the Catholic Church is the only um church that has that that belief and holds to it and the fact that it's every day that it's even possible every day I mean the you know the Episcopal Church some Episcopal churches have have a daily mass but um but my experience I I, I attended Episcopal churches for years um they they have a kind of um it's strange it's like you can believe whatever you want that technically they they also believe in the the transubstantiation but but what we noticed i mean apropos of today being um conrad's um whatever death death uh memorial um we for years we went as a family to an episcopal church and here to the cathedral and we had a lot of we still have a lot of friends there um but the fact we we experienced that it was like almost like a collective um if there are people there who don't believe but they still participate because it's like a ritual at least for us this was something that we all experienced individually and then we talked about it later and found out that we all felt the same way that somehow it doesn't feel real so when we would go to communion in the Episcopal church, even though technically it's like all the same words, the same liturgy, everything, because of course it's based on the Catholic church. Um, we didn't feel anything at all. It just seemed like a very, you know, it was something to do. It's just part of the liturgy. And I've had, it, it started when I lived in, in Europe that I had these profound, um, like earth shattering experiences going to mass and I grew up terrified of the Catholic Church, so um, it was a big shift for me. Um, and that's all I can say. It's very, it's obviously very personal because all you, you know, I was just saying to my friend the other day, it's amazing how we are instilled with certain prejudices. And I was raised with this belief in my mother's family that the Catholic Church was the the seat of all evil. And that the Pope was the like the incarnation of the devil, basically. Um, and and my mother's whole family still, um, well, a lot of them just fell away from belief, any kind of faith. But the ones that are still part of her, that church um, really believe that. And and um, so so for me, it's been a, a real journey. And it's and all I can say is it's 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 just. Um, I, I know that there's, it's a gift. I mean, you have to, everyone has their own journey. I think I think if, if one doesn't seek, one isn't going to find. I do believe that. I don't think God's just going to suddenly appear and hit people over the head with a lightning bolt and say, you know, all right, wake up, enough is enough. You know, let's let's get, get with the program here. Um, I, that's the beauty. That's, that's to me, one of the, that's to me, one of the proofs of God is that, that we have total free will. We can, um, we have that divine, I was just saying this actually to someone the other day that, that uh, we're talking about the arts, that we are, I really believe that we are small, we're made in the image of God. And so we have all the capacities that God has. I mean, of course, on a different scale, but that Conrad always said that God was an artist. And of course, since he was an art historian, um, that was the highest praise <laughs> that he could give. And he thought that, because he, he was a strong believer in evolution too, but for him, evolution was, the, was exactly the process that an artist goes through, that a great artist will try different things. And so Conrad, who loved nature, nature was his favorite thing. He, he would talk about all the different species of trees and he'd say, look, the most ancient trees are still here and the most ancient animals and insects because they were, you know, they, God tried these things out and he thought, oh, that's interesting. Let's try this now. So his view of evolution and of all the species, um, so many of which are still 
you know, they didn't go extinct. So you have like cockroaches and then you have, you know, um, the primates or whatever. <laughs> the cockroaches are the most primitive, you know, that it was, it was that, that artistic spark. And, and to him, that was evidence of God's, how God works. So um, anyway, I, I'm not, I don't know. I feel like I'm giving a lecture now. <laughs> I don't want Monia to get allergic, but you asked. No, no, Monia. no, that's, that's, um, uh, I'm very <laughs> glad that you're sharing so openly. It's, it's, it's really in, it's deep in my heart. That's all I can say. It's, um, I mean, many, many years ago when I was walking to mass every morning, this is after Conrad died, because we used to go together. I would set my alarm every night and, and then I got so resentful because some, some nights I'd stay up really late practicing the violin and, and, um, and so one day I said to God, okay, here's the deal. I, I'm so resentful when the alarm wakes me up and I'm in such a bad mood. It's, it, it just seems wrong. And I said, I said to here, going forward, here's the deal. I'm not putting on any alarm. And if you wake me up gently and you know lovingly, I will, I'll get up and get dressed and go to mass. But if you don't wake me up, I'm taking it as a message that I need the extra sleep and you, you, you know, you think I, I should rest. And sure enough, I mean, usually he woke me up, but, but, um, but, but I had, that's the relationship I have. It's, it's very, it's personal. very intimate. I very love, personal. I love the mystics too, for that reason. What? Very personal. You have a very yeah. personal relationship yeah. to God. Yeah. And when God, when Conrad died, I really hated God for a long time. I fought with him day and night, but, but he, but it wasn't, I never lost my faith. I never thought, oh, there, there can't be a God. You know, a lot of people lose their faith completely when, in, when someone dies or something, hor some horrible tragedy happens, or they even read in the news about horrible tragedies. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to go into a whole theological thing about that, but I, I've had my big, big fights with God and my periods of hatred and, and even speaking about being in someone else's space. Um, you know, I've, I've had my own boundary issues with God, but that's, all of that has made it a very dynamic relationship. It's very intimate. It's, it's more intimate than, than with any human being. And um, yeah, so I, I don't know. I, for me, this the saddest thing that I don't understand is when people really say they want faith and they can't find it. That's that's for me is is something I've always been concerned about because I don't understand. I know it is a gift, but I don't understand why it isn't accessible to some people who really seem to want it. That's for me one of the mysteries that there was a great. Um, uh, sculptor Alfred um, Rudlitschka, um, you probably you know him, Monia. Yeah, he he was actually um, originally, I guess, Czech or something, but he was v essentially Viennese. He was a major figure in the art world in Vienna, and I got to know him quite well um, when I lived in Vienna. And one night, it was after an opening of an exhibition that he had that we were at the the dinner after the opening, and he happened to be sitting next to me. And we talked about faith. He he wanted to talk about religion. And of course he was raised Catholic. And he, he said he longed to have a faith like mine. And he, he asked me how he could get it. And it just broke my heart. I've never forgotten that night because it just, I wanted to just like tear my heart out and give it to him. It was so emotional. And so it was so genuine, or at least it seemed that way. Maybe he was drunk and it maybe he woke up the next day and thought what a weird mood I was in last night <laughs> he was a heavy drinker I mean he died from it eventually um but that for me is a mystery I don't know what because I, I really believe that if you really if you really seek with all your heart you will you will find it because it's not it's not at some you know secret society that you have to be initiated into or whatever I don't know. Anyway, that does that answer your question? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, to me, it's connected with experience. So you can't do it mentally. As they also said, you can't get enlightenment when you, it's not a mental state. 
um, but if you experience, you said you had uh, some amazing experiences when you were in Vienna, and I know that once you have an experience, but I never, I never dare to be that intimate with God, because to me it's so overwhelming and so big. And uh, as Rilke said, every angel must be terrible. Because uh, yeah, it's it's uh, they are overwhelmingly so they always when they come they say don't be afraid because they are so overwhelming and and I really uh, yeah I had some mystical experiences but I was never that intimate with God and I don't want to go into the subject of transubstantiation because uh, my husband is Catholic and uh, he is still practicing. And that's one of the amazing things in my marriage that we have so different approaches to faith. Mm. But that's a completely different subject. I'm sorry yes. I, I brought it up. <laughs> but I think it's nice because you are talking about the boundaries and to be in the space of God, you know, it's also a topic. And I think we should, uh, we should add this to our uh, list of topics. What should I write down? religion and mysticism and uh, faith you know something like that but i just wanted to say one thing about the um because you're i you're absolutely right monia and of course rilke expressed it so so perfectly but that's that's the that's the um i mean if you want to use zen terms that's the koan of of um that it says there's a verse in isaiah in the Old Testament, where it says God dwells in the high and lofty places of eternity, and also in the human heart. And that's, to me, the key of the whole thing. That's why it, to fear God and the fact that when God speaks to you, the, the first thing is do not be afraid, because it, it is terrifying. I mean, imagine that, you know, a power that is encompasses the whole universe, but also in the human heart. And I think what I love the most, because I've been studying all the world religions, um, you know, well, not all of them, Islam, I'm still very much behind, but Buddhism, I've really made a deep dive and I just love it. I just, I'm totally immersed in it. Um, but the the thing that I think is so beautiful about the Christian faith is the idea of God the the self-sacrificing love to love so much to actually become a human which i would never want to be a human i mean no way like it's, <laughs> there's too too much suffering um and the fact to be willing to like step into the creation and take it on and say yes this is you know it's it's all i i don't know i anyway i can't go into the whole thing either that's a huge thing too but but that intimacy is, um, I've encountered so many people in my Buddhist path the last three years who are in so much pain and, and, and they ask the, the, the teachers and the gurus for some direction to something, something, they want something, they want comfort. They've, you know, they're, they're suffering too much and they can't stand it and they can't find the comfort in Buddhism. And, and, some you know i always want to just like jump into the, <laughs> the zoom screen and say it, it you know there you can be comforted you can um i don't see any any um conflict between buddhism and christianity but that is a unique thing there that 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 you can in the darkest hours you can you know have that that's the dark night of the soul where god is is there in the darkness anyway sorry i i we should save it for another time yes victoria we should do that that would be really good it's yeah. also you guys i have to uh, say, say goodbye. Goodbye. yeah we have to finish <laughs> now, i have to say know? goodbye I have, I have a meeting at 10 which i'm late for now i'm but no, I'm sorry <laughs> so all right so just thank, finish. You. thank you yeah um, and Maybe we could also talk about angels because in German it sounds even much more uh, excruciating when it says Rilke, jeder Engel ist schrecklich. So it's, <laughs> yeah, Schreck. There it yeah, is. Yeah. Jeder Engel ist schrecklich. And it's something because we always have these nice, cute angels and, and uh, 
or majestic or a shining light, but he says, jeder Engel ist schrecklich. So this is something I really, so I haven't met any angels yet because of that baby. <laughs> Topic is very, very uh, giving energy, but we have to close for today for your okay. other appointments and we do Thank it. You. you have it on your list, I hope. So with our faith and religion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Hope the day goes Thank well you. for you. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Thank you, Christine. Thank you.